Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Ingo Blechschmidt. I'm very happy to introduce, yeah, I, really matter, uh, to introduce Peter Arndt to you, uh, who will give this uh, introduction to abstract and motivic commutative theory. And as I told you in the email, you get a special present, special gift, if you are the first who asks a mathematical question. So please be extroverted, ask questions. Okay, then that's that. Yeah, hello, thanks for coming. Uh, I want to say before we start that I totally agree with this email that Ingo wrote about the spirit of this course. You should all intervene, you should not let me get carried away, stop me if I say something you don't know. And I don't know, steer this course in any direction where it, where it uh, suits you best. Yeah? I mean, I'm not uh, too determined on what has to happen here. I mean, we can, they can take detours, we can uh, get quicker or slower as you, as you think this could. Okay, um, so the first part, I mean most of today, like all of today, I guess, will be the abstract homotopy theory part. And uh, so that's, that's maybe a bit dry if you have zero motivation, so that's what I start with. I give you a preview on, on why I do this and what, what we what will treat with these abstract methods, then we go for the abstract part. I mean, not that you can complain, you came to a course on abstract quantum theory, I guess you cannot be uh, outraged if it gets abstract, but still, motivation is always good. So, let's start with the picture of homotopy theory, a, a certain hexagon that uh, will haunt you through the second half of the course. And, I mean, possible complaints are also that you cannot read my handwriting, but you don't get a prize for that. <laughs> Can you read it? Yes. Okay, so my uh, picture of homotopy theory is this. Let's, well, let's start with some notations. So there's always this uh, annoying topic in, in topology, uh, how to set up the category of topological spaces. We all know the definition of topological space, and somehow uh, it's too general. So for now, at least, I say topological space means CW complex. Category of CW complexes will be denoted by the top and continuous maps, of course. And if I have any category, I can, with a terminal object, I have the pointed version Categories, this is the uh, comma category top below the terminal object. Do you know this? Comma categories, slice categories. No? no? Okay. That's just this objects are, are maps from the points to some spaces and morphisms are triangles. What does that mean? Just means in every space I, I choose a base point, so called base point, it's just a point, and my continuous maps on to resolve these points. And this is, of course, something you can do with any category. And I'll keep this notation as the lower star. Okay, then um, with this other piece of notation here, I just denote by I. The unit interval. That's the thing that parameterizes homotopies. Okay, so in algebraic topology, we look at uh, algebraic invariants of topological spaces, right? And the best kind of algebraic invariant uh, are cohomology theories. So 
I define for you what that is. I define reduced cohomology theory and then uh, the just plain cohomology theory in terms of this. Somehow it's slicker this way. What is it? It's a function. And um, yeah, so the reduced ones are defined on pointed spaces and the general well, unqualified cohomology theories are defined for general spaces, unpointed. So this would be a functor on pointed spaces, let's call it E, to sequences of Abelian groups, uh, contravariant. You can write it like this. Just write an E star of X here. And by this I mean that the grading is indexed here with the star. I'm going to write it as a. If I pick out a particular grade here, then I write this N. Right? And uh, these cohomology theories can be defined as such functors, satisfying a few properties. So at first they should be homotopy invariant. That means you, you might think it means that homotopical continuous functions should be mapped to the same thing, that's true. But I choose to phrase it this way. If I take some space x and take the product of the unit interval and have a projection of course to x. And I can apply my homology theory to this map. And it should induce an isomorphism. That's homotopy invariance. Second. Should be the so called suspension isomorphisms. It should be natural isomorphisms. Uh, Okay. So um, yeah, I guess I'll define it because of the lecture. Maybe not not in the middle of this definition now, but <laughs> if you know singular cohomology, then this makes a bit of sense because singular cohomology looks at uh, well the nth group here is sort of built out of the n cells, n-dimensional spheres mapped into your space, and if you shift up the space by a suspension, then these n spheres become n plus 1 spheres. So, uh, yeah, who knows what a suspension is, what the sigma is? Fewer people. Aha, that's that I should define. Uh, I define it over here. Yep. Suspension is a construction of ontological spaces. It works as follows. I have a space X, and um, I take, well, I should um, take a point space, let's say. And then what I do with it, I take the product of the unit interval and I identify a few things down to one point. So I have x cross 0 and I have x cross 1 and I have, let's say 0 is the base point of the unit interval and I have, um, what now I have? Um, 
So there's a standard picture for this. If this is my space x, then sigma x, well, <coughs> well x cross the unit interval will be such a thing. It's just a cylinder. And now I collapse the top and the bottom to one point. That means this quotient here. And it looks like this. Now my original space x here is suspended in the middle somehow. It's hanging there. And uh, okay, you have this other collapsing thing. That means that's a little line here that I also collapsed. But that's irrelevant. This point is in here good enough, then it doesn't really make a difference whether I do this or not. Okay, so that's the picture of sigma x. And so these. This EN, you should think of them as measuring n dimensional information about my space. And so, if I, let's say I have a, an n dimensional sphere sitting in here, then this will become an n plus one dimensional sphere sitting in the suspension. And that's how you should think about this suspension isomorphism. Okay, so for those who don't know singular homology, that's something we couldn't talk about in the course of this, these weeks. So yeah, but that's the second axiom. We have a suspension axiom. Uh, third. That's the wedge axiom. So what's the wedge? I guess I should say that too then. So if I have Pointed spaces, base points PI, whole collection, indexed by some R, maybe I is a bad name now, J. Then I can form the wedge product. It's just the disjoint union of these XIs, and I identify all these base points here. circles here, and they become just a bunch of circles glued at the same point. That's the wedge. Yeah. yeah. Let's start with the stupid question himself. Uh, I have a map from x to the suspension, or I have a projection from the suspension to x? What map do I have? Or concretely, what map in you don't have is I have some uh, Inclusion of x into the suspension, or is well, there okay. a way that's actually not specified. I just need um, some isomorphism, some natural isomorphism. But it's a good question. I do have a map, just putting x, you know, as uh, as the middle thing here. So I could map x into uh, x cross one half, let's say, and then it would become this middle thing. <coughs> that's not the one I mean. For now, let's uh, yeah. We just uh, ask for such an I suppose to exist. I mean, this here would not really uh, boost up the cells, would it? Yeah, I don't actually. Actually, maybe that's the one that induces it. Good question, actually. <laughs> and what I have planned, I didn't. I don't have to uh, use any origin of this isomorphism, but but actually, you can take that one. I think. I want to say. And in any case, you have just won the special secret prize. <laughs> <laughs> the prize was to be the first questioner in that course. <laughs> but there will also be a material gift later on. I'm very happy for you. <laughs> Honorable mention to the, for the watchers, anonymous person. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what about this wedge axiom here? So if I have a bunch of spaces, I can glue them at their common base points, or at their base points, and so that they become one common point. What is this? This is the co-product in the category of pointed spaces. This co-product should turn into a product. Maybe I make this into a date as well. 
<coughs> now this here is induced by a canonical mass. I have inclusions from each xi into this whole wedge, and upon applying this cohomology theory, which is contravariant, they will induce maps the other way around, and that's what uh, gives a linear map from here to here. And I just uh, checked on the NLAP, uh, they require in condition two that it's uh, that the induced morphism is the isomorphism. This one? Yes. Uh, and they don't, well, they phrase it in a different way uh, regarding the cone instead of the suspension. But still, they require that the canonical morphism in that situation is an isomorphism. So, probably we should also require that the okay. canonical morphism is an isomorphism. Okay, fourth axiom, and that's, that will be it. Um, if I have a good enough inclusion, which uh, I can tell you what it means. I mean, this is just you know a motivating preview only, so we're going to get deeper later on. If I have such inclusions, so I have a subspace of x, then I can collapse it to a point. And this should yeah, I can then apply my homology theory to, to these three spaces and the maps, and this should induce an exact sequence. I go the other way around. Exactness doesn't mean much, it's, it only makes sense in the middle here because you need two maps coming in and out for, for saying exact. So the kernel of this map should be equal to the image of this map. That's it, that's a commodity theory. I see an emerging question now. Oh, okay. uh, why we don't consider the product? Uh, you mean the cup product for a commodity? Because there are commodity theories which, which do not have a ring structure. That's a, that's a meaningful extra structure which we will consider. But there are examples which just don't have that. Okay, so this is a reduced commodity theory, and if you want a commodity theory, let's this here. It is just it's a functor of the form. No, no, I don't require base points in spaces. But if I have some space, I can just add a base point. So take this point with an extra point, and I declare this one the base point. Yeah, so I said objects here are maps from, from one point space to my given space, and I just make my one point space with this disjoint this floating, floating around somewhere. And now I'm in point space, and I can know <coughs> already what is a pretty good commodity. Examples of these commodity theories. There's um, yes, singular homology, it's probably the best known one. There is topological K theory. Complex and, and real one. So this is something that this is sort of something that measures what are what are the holes in your space. This is something that looks at vector bundles that exist over your space. There is uh, something called cobordism, complex cobordism. 
that uh, depending on where this course goes, will reappear. You don't have to know it now, I'm just saying so there's, there's many examples. And there's, yeah, Murava K theories, E theories. I don't know what, there's a, there's a lot. What's your personal favorite? I guess maybe this one, yeah. KU, complex K theory. Although this one's wonderful, actually. Maybe this one. <laughs> I think this one. I'll tell you why it's wonderful later on, if that's where the course goes. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah? Yes. Sorry to ask again, but. Um, no. Thank you for asking. So, E upper star xi is some object in a sequence of abelian groups, and now you take the product. So, am I supposed to think of this as some weird big product? No, it's not, nothing where mixed so degree is anything. It's the product of this category, but that means just level wise product. Okay, so I can think of just erase the star and write an n and yes. yeah. for all n. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Another question. Okay, so what I what I want to uh, aim for ah, yeah. this is okay if I erase this board. I want to point at the, the other board while drawing a big diagram. And here it goes. So such cohomology theories factorize through a bunch of other functors and categories in the way. And we'll in this first part of this course we will go we we'll follow this way a bit. So we start with logical spaces. And let's look at singular cohomology. Not just, for example, let's look exactly at singular cohomology. <laughs> it goes to a sequence of abelian groups. And it's contravariant, but I put the op here now. It doesn't matter. And now these axioms just tell us that this will factorize through a bunch of intermediate categories. So by axiom one, this thing is uh, homotopy invariant, means it turns such morphisms into isomorphisms. Okay, so this is a universal category which turns these morphisms in here, right? These are continuous maps, these projections from X cross I to X, into isomorphisms. That's the localization. That will be, uh, I take for all X, I take these projections and I add inverses to this. That's what's called a localization. That will be today's topic. And just by the universal property, by the property one here, the universal property of this localization, so it's sort of the, the initial functor uh, which turns this collection of maps into, in, into isomorphisms, it will have to factorize through here, right? Okay. So, This will also be called category of spaces because this is a lot of right here. And it's it's a universally used uh, notation by now. So next thing. So homotopy equivalent topological spaces will be isomorphic objects in that category, right? No, yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Yeah. To begin with, yes. I mean, depends a bit what you, by what we mean. Uh, by this localization process. Uh -huh. So what you can do is just perform this localization such that you get a new category and then yes. Yeah. The equivalent space will be isomorphic in here. It turns out that this is a bit too brutal a thing to do. So what we will do instead, localization will then mean uh, that we get an infinity category or a spaces enriched or simplicity enriched category or something. That's what we will get into today. Mm -hmm. 
But yes, the first approach is to really just uh, turn these into actual isomorphisms. It still would factorize. It would be fine. Mm -hmm. But later on, we will refine this picture. OK, so next thing that we can do is uh, notice that this is a pointed category. Yeah? There is a, there's an object in here that, that, has a, that points to everything universally, because we have the zero abelian group. So this is up that, um, Now we have the sequence of zero groups, and there's a unique morphism to every abelian group, so this is the same as such a, such a category under this object. It's pointed, that's what you're saying. And you can, given any category, you can make a, a pointed category out of it by just, well, any category of the terminal object by passing to this comma category. So that's what we do. That's pointed spaces. <laughs> It is, uh, yeah. This is under. Yeah, and any cohomology theory has to factorize through this too because it goes into a pointed category. That's the universal pointed category associated with this one. Okay, so next thing we can do is look at this second axiom. So the second axiom tells us what happens if we, do, if we perform suspension on our spaces. Yeah, we, have a, we have an end functor here, suspension, which takes a space and spits out a new space. If we, if we apply this, then it has the effect of shifting our sequence of abelian groups by one. But shifting this sequence of abelian groups by one is something that is a reversible end functor here. We can just shift it back. Nothing that, we, that makes us forget anything. And there is a universal category which um, makes this endofunctor invertible. Let me introduce this notation. It's not an in inversion of, of morphisms, it's an inversion of this endofunctor. It turns it into an equivalence. So, <coughs> This functor here is called sigma infinity, and so this again comes with, a, with an end functor called sigma, and it has a universal property that for any other category with an end functor, such that uh, let me write this here. Let's call it f. And any functor to here, which uh, respects the sigma, so f after sigma, uh, well, sorry, um, g. f after g should be the same as g after sigma. There should be an essentially unique to whatever functor going through here. So it's the universal thing where the sigma becomes a vertical, becomes an auto equivalence. Yeah, and, well, it's not clear that such a thing exists, so we will construct it in, along the course. But if it exists, then it's clear that any cohomology theory has to factorize through this too, because it goes to somewhere where this sigma becomes an invertible operation. It's just a shifting, and it can shift back. This is called the category spectrum. I'm just giving an overview. Now, we have used so far the first two axioms for cohomology theory. And there's two remaining. Now, these here, <coughs> they sort of look a bit like, well, maybe not visibly the way I wrote it down, but they sort of give us conditions that would be satisfied by a representable functor. Representable functors contravariant functors turn co-products into products. That's what this does. And this here can sort of be rephrased as turning 
sort of push out into pool banks. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something that a representable functor would do. And there's the so-called Brown representability theorem, which says that this is sort of enough. Three and four imply that commodity theories are representable in this category. <laughs> Three and four. What is it? Uh, representable in the spectrum. That means now, if I have something like this, I have an. I have an Commodity theory E, and I take the nth cohomology group E and X, and this is maps and spectra from all the n fold suspension of X to some spectrum E. And I mean, we have these examples of commodity series, they all have their spectrum living in here. So we have uh, the eigenbank plane spectrum in here, that's what represents singular cohomology. Okay, you, I mean, you have spectra for all of these cohomologies. So, for example, singular cohomology. This the maps from well to be more precise I should well I start with my space X here. I should come here, then join the base point, all this plus this functor. Then apply the sigma infinity, and then I'm in the right place. So actually, to be more precise here, I could have written sigma infinity x plus. And particularly for this uh, singular cohomology, we have some with the Einberg plane spectrum. Say more about later. Now, somebody has asked, what about the cup product? Don't I want some, some kind of multiplication in my axioms? Not always, but often enough, we do have multiplications in these, in these groups, some which make this into a graded ring somehow. And if we do, then often enough, this is reflected by some multiplication here. There's a monoid structure on spectra. <laughs> called smash product. So that means I can I can form the product of, sma of smash product of spectra. For example, I have a monoid structure. On this Einberg phase spectrum. Yeah, it's a multiplication map here. And this is what induces the, the cup product in similar cohomology. So this makes this thing into, into sort of a, a ring spectrum. That's what you say to it. It's a ring spectrum. Uh, well, it's just a monoid in this category, but the addition is somehow there. And so given a ring spectrum, we can call, we can form the category for modules over it. Let's just And that module that would be some other spectrum with a multiplication map here, satisfying associativity of the things you would expect from a module. Okay, so now 
We have a category of HZ modules and we have a free HZ module fund. Namely just smashing which with this HZ itself. No? Given any spectrum, I can put an extra factor HZ in front and then I have this multiplication map by just multiplying mm -hmm. the factor. No? We'll be more precise about everything, just giving an overview. <laughs> and now this is a free HZ module. It's a left adjoint, so I have a, I've also, if I have an HZ module, I can forget about this multiplication, that would be a right adjoint back to spectra. And by this adjunction property for HZ is one, this is this maps from, from, from my spectrum, from my sigma infinity x plus to HZ. And spectra is the same as HZ module maps from here. No, I just form the, it's like, like sets and groups, let's say. If I have maps from some set to some group, then it's the same as group homomorphisms from the free group on that set to that group. I just form the free HZ module. So I can see that, now that's something special to HC, yeah, right? because I have the ring spectrum here representing it. So this uh, singular commodity factor will also still factor through here, because I just <coughs> said how it does. And now this, in case you know what it, what it means, it's the derived category of abelian groups. That means it's chain complexes of groups up to quasi-isomorphism. <coughs> and from here to here, you can just take the cohomology of a complex. That's a factorization of singular cohomology. Okay, so this is a picture of homotopy theory and algebraic topology. The big one, which leaves a lot to explain, and we'll dive into it. Uh, but as a, as a little preview on, on what this course will be about, well, it will include an introduction to homotopy homotopy theory. And motivic homotopy theory mimics this picture here. So, in motivic homotopy theory, we want to do the same for schemes or varieties, whatever you prefer. So, I put algebraic varieties in this corner. I, I want to study cohomology theories of algebraic varieties. And these cohomology theories will have similar properties. So, I can factor through something here. I don't have a unit interval in schemes, but I have a fine line. That's what I contract here. You can always make a category pointed. I can do something like spectra in an appropriate way. <coughs> I can form modules of a ring spectra, and so this whole thing, this kind of setup, uh, can be abstracted and used for a drag geometry. That's what we aim for towards the end. But yeah, to understand that, we should first understand what we did here. I didn't explain way enough. So that would be the introduction. Are there any questions about this other than explain more? <laughs> yes. This suspension function that you have in the spectrum category yes. translates also to the H Z mod H Z H Z mod, I suppose. So That's right. this is the same suspension that you have in the derived category Absolutely. coming from the triangulated structure. It becomes the shift function of this right. Yes. So this, since you seem to know what is relevant category is, this category is itself triangulated already, okay. and this becomes a multiple triangulated. Yes. <coughs> Further questions so far? Okay. I'm not sure if the answer is important just for carrot paper, and since you mentioned it, uh, you construct spectra from spaces by the sigma infinity, which is some fun co-limit of sigma, 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 blah, blah. Uh, That's how I construct this thing, yeah? This is my name for the functor, but yeah. yeah. You get the spectra, and this is not the same category of spectra that Lurie constructs, but often it's the same. Do you, by instant, know that your spectra are the same as Lurie's spectra? Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, Lurie's... 
Okay, spectral values. I, I mean, explain me later how it's different. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even define it, so <laughs> I just said it has universal property. But yeah, the real spectra do have that universal property. Within, well, in the world of presentable infinity categories, maybe that's the that's property the that you're presentable. Yeah, presentable. I, I, stayed I don't know what words. presentable means, I just know it's equivalent <laughs> to something's presentable. Yes. Okay. No, I, I always I didn't say every every world that has to occur here, but yes, yeah, okay. I, I stay in the world of presentable categories. Thank you. Okay. Then let's dive into this. So the first thing we'll we'll treat today is localization of categories. What how to invert morphisms in a category and what can happen there. Because that's something we will have to do for schemes, and that already happens for explosion spaces, and it's surprisingly subtle, and there's a whole abstract theory around it. What to do in this, in this first step. <laughs> also, you'll need uh, some knowledge of this first step to actually later say how to do this here. And let's see now. Uh, this is new to me. <laughs> I first thought this was like an Indiana Jones way to <laughs> delete the, the board in a stylish way. But By the way, today you still have these shields in front of you, so now's the day to throw paper balls at me. <laughs> the other days will be in other rooms. <laughs> okay, let's get more details and more boring. of categories. So what do we want to do? We are in a, in a situation. Ah, why, why don't I just start with this notion here? A relative category is just a pair of a category and a class of morphisms there is. What we want to do is treat these relative categories uh, as the W saying us, well, that these things should be equivalent. We want to understand these models in W as equivalent somehow, in some vague sense so far. What maybe, well, the first thing we want to try is to turn them into isomorphism, so doing this localization. So there's a lot of, and that's something that occurs all the time. In mathematics, you want to classify some kind of objects, and then it's too hard, and then you <coughs> like invent some some notion of equivalence between these objects, and there you are, have a, a relative category. So I mean the example that is really most telling and somehow fundamental, also in a, a very technical sense, uh, for this whole thing, is C topological spaces. And W on top equivalences. Well, remember I said top RCW complexes. There's a few. Maybe I should put all this here. There's a few variants of this, and we, we should maybe at least have said it once. So another version would be, let's call it top with a double T. And of course, it makes sense in general to say almost equivalences. Uh, 
but then there is a, a more common notional equivalent that you choose in this case if you, if you treat all topological spaces yeah, with a double T. Then usually you, you ask for weak equivalences, and that's what the W stands for, weak equivalence. That would be all continuous maps such that which induce on all higher homotopy groups isomorphisms, including the zeroth homotopy group, which is not a group, but it's the set of connected components, path components. So, who knows what higher homotopy groups are? Okay. Who does not know? Just say how is the counter? <laughs> the end homotopy group of the space is the set of of homotopy classes in the end sphere too. So you know who knows what homotopy is, right? That's very what I should check. <laughs> yeah? Well, everybody knows what the group is. <laughs> Okay, uh, so class of continuous maps from the n sphere to x. And so we, I mean, you have uh, implicitly chosen a base point, right? Uh, yeah, I should have, I guess. Base points preserving continuous maps. <coughs> okay, so then, uh, well, you should have asked up here already. If I say homotopy equivalence, you have to know what homotopy is. <laughs> Shame on you. Don't let these things pass. Okay, well, so what is the uh, between spaces between the same spaces and a homotopy between them there's a map H and X cross the unit interval to Y <coughs> such that uh, if I carry three this to X cross the zero if I insert zero in this in this other second variable get F Restricted to one, I get G. So it's a deformation of, of this map F into G. Does it give us, I mean, if, if you look at the other way around, if you uh, fix a point X here, in this, in this uh, space where both maps start, and then let, the, let this uh, other variable wander with the, with the unit interval, let's say it's X. This is y, uh, I fix the point. This would be f of x. This would be this would be g of x. And then for this fixed x, I would get a power from here to here. The homotopy does this for every point in x mechanics. So it's a sort of a deformation of paths continuous in a continuous way, which transforms this f into this g. Okay, and uh, the requirement that there exists a homotopy between two maps, that's an equivalence relation. If I divide it out, that's what I get here. So these are continuous maps from SN to X, modulo equivalence relation of existence of a homotopy.
Okay, and uh, well, this happens to be, uh, of course, it's a functor. Yeah? I can, it's a co representable functor. You can vary the x in here, and then it just always compose maps. And that makes this pi n a functor. It happens to be a group valued functor, but whatever. It's just a functor. Two sets from that. And I can say that uh, continuous map is a weak equivalence if it induces isomorphism between these homotopy sets for every n. So, what's the intuition about this? Why, why do we put Sn here? Well, <laughs> Sn, these are, these are spheres. I map them into some, into some space x. Yeah. Then I can uh, look at homotopy class. Yeah? If, I have, if I have several such maps, I can ask. Whether, so I get sort of an image of, of this sphere in X. I can ask whether I can deform one such sphere to another one. And when can I can I maybe not do that? Let's let's take S1, the one sphere, the circle. Uh, this is just a plane without the hole. Well, if I have a circle going around here, I cannot deform it into a circle going around here because I would have to pass through the hole. So this is measuring n-dimensional holes. And this is sort of how you try to assess what space, what kinds of holes are there and how many. Okay. Well, uh, let's continue uh, this theme here a bit. More examples. Of course, we can. Declare maps with equivalence if, for example, the stable homotopy groups, if you know what that is, uh, all uh, become, well, if, if this map induces isomorphisms under all the stable homotopy groups, or let's take homology isomorphisms. <laughs> or cohomology. You can put all kinds of invariants here and just say, I want to distinguish space only up to that invariant now. And that gives you a notion of equivalence. I mean, these are all of the form. I have a, a category C. I have a functor to some D. I declare W to be the pre image of the isomorphism. The functors here were just the product of all the phi ends and the product of all the h ends. That always gives you, you know, for every kind of invariant, you get such a relative category that makes sense. Maybe. Uh, Here's another one of the derived categories. We have chain complexes, R modules for some ring R, and we have the quasi isomorphisms. It's another example. Using isomorphisms, if you apply the homology functor. Okay. On a chain complex, you just take all everywhere kernel modulo image, yeah. and then you get a, this is a functor yeah. on every level. This always becomes nice, and then you say, okay, my map wasn't equivalent, a quasi iso. So it's basically exactly the same recipe again. What else can we do? We can, for example, And 
convert all morphisms. Just force everything to be isomorphic. We end up with something possibly non trivial. We get all the automorphism groups, but somehow mingled now, so there are many things may change. It's a group fortification of, when we localize, it will be the group fortification of C. Uh, here's an important one that I want to use as an example. How about the category of categories and functors? We have a natural notion of equivalence there. That's something we might want to see categories only up to equivalence. I mean, we do in practice, and that's... We can test whatever we do now in this course uh, by looking what happens in this example. Well, there's more. I mean, I suggest that you come up with examples of your own. How about, you know... I don't know if this has been studied, probably. Take rings and... Take a equivalence ring or morphisms inducing uh, equivalence of categories between the module categories. Equivalence from R modules to S modules. That's sort of Morita equivalence. Could be just the same for the derived categories instead, and that's stable equivalences. You, you name it. Uh, probably you bring, it's better to bring them to their own fields of study. I would have an example from logic, for example. Everybody probably knows. Okay, so now what, what do we want to do with these localized, these uh, relative categories? We want to localize them. First thing we try is to force the things in W to be. Uh, Example A is a to enter to say that the map from R to S is a vector. vector. Don't know. I don't think so. No, I don't think no, so. No, no. Like the map from Z to Q, mm -hmm. not not at all an equivalence of, of uh, module categories. We've got a few vector spaces on one side and that game groups here, but it's basically flat, right? Mm. It's it's it's, it's flat, but it's flat. not faithfully flat. flat. It's not faithfully flat. Oh, faithful, right? Yes, okay. because uh, where, when you tether over Q, with Q, then torsion vanishes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Faithfully flat. I mean, faithfully flat should mean that this functor is fully faithful, right? But what does it mean? I think so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that would not be enough. I mean, every every. Yeah. But then we have faithfully flat descent for. Yeah. Well, it's not sure how this works out for non-commutative rings, but. I'm all used to this for such difference. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> this kind of question. I don't know, yeah, good question. Well, probably, I mean, in, in any of these cases, it's always a good thing to try and characterize these motions in yeah. different ways. Okay, so <coughs> let's define localization. So, how, what do we want to achieve? A or B localization of the relative category CW, or you also say uh, localization of C at W. Um, 
What is it? It's a fun term. C to some part which is denoted like this. It's like in adjoining artificial inverses to these morphisms in W. It's called an L for localization. Such that, uh, well, first, should map W through isomorphisms. And it should be initial. It should be the most economic way of doing that. So, formally, say this here for any category D and some kind of F, such that F maps W to the ISOs in D, there should exist. from here to here, plus a natural isomorphism, and this should be unique up to that isomorphism. And so that's a, it's a bit of a two-categorical thing to, to say here. It's a universal property. Uh, I want this to be the initial category receiving a functor from C which turns the models in W into isomorphisms. But initial meaning now to blah, blah, blah. And in fact, by a happy accident, it would also be OK to stay strict. To stay strict, it's yeah. The same thing, that's the next thing I have to say. <coughs> and maybe that's actually possible exercise. Yeah. Let's call this maybe a strict localization. Functor turning the morphisms of W into isomorphisms such that for every F which does this, there's an actual a unique functor here. Obviously, every strict localization. Uh, is, is uh, localization in this sense. And so what's, what's the point in, in saying this here? We find after equivalent. If I have some strict localization in some category equivalent to this one here, it will generally not be strict anymore, but we'll have that. Who here is familiar with the notion of evil in category theory? Evil, evil like the opposite of good. Okay, we can discuss that later. It's an evil notion, this one here, in the sense of the NLAB, or maybe it was deleted from the NLAB? It was deleted it? from the NLAB because the fear that people would be upset. Okay. Uh, of that, uh, with that ins inside job. I meant to discuss it uh, in private. So yeah. I refer to the end. But it's an evil notion in that it's not, it's a notion uh, of category theory which is not invariant under equivalence of categories. That's evil about it. So, um, <laughs> well, any category, you know, C, W, one, one, tilde. Equivalent to a strict localization will be a localization but 
not in general strict. And then let's say it's exercise one. Let's call it 2.4. So we have to really uh, show that this natural isomorphism is necessary and this uniqueness up to natural iso is necessary. Uh, I, so that's one, one direction, that's for the not in general speed direction. Uh, I don't like to spend too much time with this, so hint, uh, consider Like just just a small category, category with two arrows and two objects here. Or one arrow, two objects. So there's not much to localize. You have one icon choice here to localize something, and then you can consider. Well, you can find a strict localization of this, and then you can find equivalent categories to to that strict localization. Will be just you know category with two objects and one isomorphism between them. It's a strict localization. Then you can find equivalent categories which tell you that in general you have to demand natural isomorphisms here. Okay. So questions of course now when do these localizations exist? And to, to get a hint on how to construct one, let's reformulate this, this requirement here. Uh, and actually, the good news is the script one always exists. If you are willing to detonate your universe of set theory, but I am. <laughs> And uh, in this case, <coughs> let's observe the following. We have a strict localization. If and only if uh, the following is a pullback, a uh, push out. We take, now let's write it vertically. class W of morphisms. So for every morphism in here, we just take a copy of the, of the category with just one arrow and two objects. Now we have a, <laughs> we have a map to here to see, which just chooses these, these morphisms in the class W. You know what I mean? So for every, yeah, I, I, I'm here, uh, I have a destroyed union and at the at the summit corresponding to some specific morphism in W, I just map it to that morphism. Okay, so I can now invert every single one of these morphisms. And then form a push out. And I claim what the outcome will be a strict localization here. And that's equivalent to being a strict localization. Why is it so? Because, well, if I have some D and some functor F such that um, F W part of the isomorphisms, well, that means exactly that these morphisms from W factor through here because they become isomorphisms. And then I want a unique map here. <laughs> okay, now if you uh, remember, you maybe know such a situation, maybe not. If you remember uh, the amalgamated product of groups, that's exactly a push-out construction. Do you know that? Who knows the amalgamated product of groups? Maybe from the Van Kappen theorem. Okay, then that's not something that can use for intuition. Uh, 
Um, okay, let's attempt a construction of this localization. I claim is suggested by this 2.5, but only if you know something like this push out of the match bright structure somehow. So, so this is I want to construct this strict localization, and I have to say what the objects are. They're just the same objects as you see. That's good for this. Uh, Strict uniqueness here, and I don't have any choice here. Mm -hmm. And I have to say what morphisms and optics are. Or I would have to say what the set of morphisms is. It can become a class, but as I said, I, for now at least, there. Should morphisms from A to B should be equivalent class of such zigzags. What's a zigzag? It's a bunch of arrows in C, which can bo go uh, both ways. But if they go the wrong way, then they should be from W. Okay. This thing is called a zigzag. So this, uh, I want to go from A to B, and sometimes I have to walk backwards here. These backwards arrows are only allowed for things from W. Okay. And... A few of them, and so this, this tilde here should be the equivalence relation generated by uh, three requirements. So if I have a zigzag which comes here with a G and um, I have an F. And then in the other direction, then I should be able to cancel them out. Yeah? I want to see these backwards arrows as the inverses of the forward equivalent. So if this f here uh, comes twice, well, it has to end at x or i. And then it may go on somehow. So this I want to be equivalent to just the same thing with, uh, well, let's say an identity in the middle. And those outer arrows could also be in different directions, G and H, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe I should. <coughs> yeah. No, I, I don't care what the signal is in. So I also have the other situation that these f's go the other way. Right? This backwards arrow comes afterwards. This should also be replaced by the identity if you want. Third, and that's it, we should be able to compose uh, composable arrows which occur in the zigzag. This 
should be equivalent to just well, I can make a short of this and put K composed with H. And I think we need one more saying that we can remove identity morphisms. That is by composition. But if, if my zigzag has length yeah. one, yeah. oh, then composing doesn't remove it, you say. You want length zero? Yes, yeah. Do we need length zero in zigzags? Not really, do we? I don't know. Maybe it should be safe? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's say this is ten best. Okay, I can can remove identity. Yeah. This only plays a role for pass it from zero to from like zero to the next one. I'm not sure we so. need that. Because otherwise I just compose and then it's gone. Yeah, right then. In the, the composition interacted. Uh, also in the other direction. Yeah, if, if both of yeah. these arrows would go the other way, I also am allowed to propose them. And then they would be called H after K. Mm -hmm. I think there might be a problem without the addition if we have an identity morphism in the wrong direction in a longer zigzag where we would want to compose the first morphism and the third one but we can't because there's an identity in the other direction in the middle could that be yes i was okay i was thinking that i just don't have directions so i have both directions ah okay yeah yeah yeah, maybe that's that's pretty good. Yeah. yeah. So is the class W closed under composition then for the last two work? Mm. Yeah. You're right, it should be for this to make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So for for now this is a construction just that which is doable like this, but then we get some some mess. If we uh, demand Even if we demand this, the outcome will still be a mess. But <laughs> <laughs> To, to do here is to refine a category, and well, we obviously have um, the stuff that it's made of, but we need structure, we need composition, and that's just concatenation of zigzags. I just put one after the other. Well, meaning I choose some representatives of my class.
Tom. Um, what I mean with this, yeah, we have, we have a set theoretic problem here. Usually you define a category to be a class of morphisms, uh, of objects, and for every two objects, we want a set of morphisms. Okay, now, if we have a class of objects, well, this thing here, before we write out by the return relation, for sure is a, is a proper class. Well, if the category is connected enough at least. Because here, these zigzags can have any length that we can pass through any object in this huge class here. Yeah? So this is no longer a set. It can happen now when you divide this out that we are back to having a set because we identified so much. So, but we don't know. Generally. But if we don't care, if, or if it is a set, um, then this is a localization, a strict one. Exercise is easy. Uh, it's just you know. Well, so far we just define this category. So what we do, we do. We have the morphism here. We assign the zigzag of length one just consisting of that morphism. We have the same object anyway, and here we just take this zigzag. And given any functor, some d, sending it down to isos, I just define, uh, given any zigzag here, or given any morphism here, I take a representative, which is zigzag, and Example and GH will get mapped to I have to find an F bar here. We get mapped to what, F of X and then if it goes the wrong way I was in W, so there is an inverse in, in D, and that's what I take. Goes the right direction, that's then I can just apply F directly. And then it goes the wrong direction again, I just take the inverse again. That's the pattern, right? And I have no choice, so if, if I want absolute uniqueness here, I have no choice left. I mean, I know what to do with the models. This to, con to commute strictly. Um, well, I know what to do with the, with the morphemes coming from here, and all the all the additional ones somehow are zigzags where I have inverse, and I know what to do with the inverses too, so, so now... Knowing what it has to do with the morphism from C also determines what it has to do with the inverses, and that's it. One choice left. And every morphism in here is composition of Things from C and inverses. Maybe that's sentence worth like.
no Okay, now we know how to localize categories. There's a bit of, a, of this problem there still with uh, possibly two big home sets, which are not even sets, that we can get around that in practice. This happens, for example, by model structures. So we, uh, there will be an exercise where you see how this is not a problem in the case of topological spaces. And yeah, let's get that. Got this localization of our category. That's that should be a place where we have achieved what we wanted. That we identified the objects which, which behave the same under under one equivalence. So what can we do there? Well, not not so much in general. I mean, it's it's, a, it's an unwieldy and strange category that we have constructed potentially at least. Let's. Try to, and that's probably the best thing you can do is just use the universal property of it. You can also try and use the construction. I mean, it's hard to control in ways which we will make more precise. Um, for example, this functor L needn't be full or faithful. Let's take the category which is the natural numbers, it's a monoid. You can see a monoid as a category by just taking one object and um, The elements of the monoid are the morphisms, and composition is the operation of the monoid. So an identity we should have zero. Okay. Then let's just localize it by everything. Why should it be full? And it's also not in general faithful, for example. Well, there's, there's another example of this kind. Um, see the monoid. Let's see, say. This here, we have a neutral element and another element which is entirely important. If I invert that one, it will become the neutral element. Let me see. 
We have now an inverse to this E. Put the parentheses. Well, the identity of our single object is this, but well, that's the same as this here, because I can just double up this one and then I cancel these and I got a put my and it got identified with the, with the unit and so it's not. I mean that's not a bad source of examples. Actually these models here, a lot, lot of things happen there. But here's another one and that's I'm going to have a hint for the next exercise. And we have arrows like this. We have uh, an F and a G, and we have something the other way around. S, S maybe for a section. You could command that that uh, it's a section of both F and G. You don't have to just suppose that. These compositions are equal. Maybe I did it wrong edge, but and now we we invert this arrow S. <coughs> and we, again we can say okay F and G got it. With the same trick, basically. I mean, this is sort of an item point situation. Yeah, so, I mean, just by adding inverses, we can still start forcing relations that we maybe didn't expect before. And so this can be used. For an exercise. So So I was talking about this uh, in the case of topological spaces about this category where you invert all these projections from X cross unit into nodes. What you more commonly consider in topology crosses is the homotopy category. or whatever with this, and morphisms from A to B are continuous maps from A to B modulo this existence of orbital. Uh, we identify homotopical maps. Then exercise would be show that this is actually equivalent to where we inverted these projections. Hmm. can do this purely with, with the things I said so far.
and use this one. So the point is, I mean, uh, further hint, the sum to be calculated has itself a universal property. It's the, uh, the, the we have a projection functor. And it has a real property, namely it's the initial functor among all functors which identify on topical maps. Mm -hmm. That's the quotient thing. And so now we have two things which are real properties, and you have to say show that one satisfies the other property of the other, and you get maps both ways, you have to show that they compose to that end. Yeah. But I do it maybe. And here's another one. Um, so if I have <coughs> full subcategory here of some D and a <coughs> reflection functor. Who knows what a reflective subcategory is? Everybody? That means, well, I have subcategory here, some, some objects in here, the morphism notion of morphism is the same as in D. Somehow you should think that these here are better ones than, than those ones in D. They can approximate any object in D universally from the right by something in C. Uh, so that's. Subcategory, if you want. Well, I, I write this root functor again. So that for every other, that's right. So for every other uh, object in C and model here, I have a unique thing. I mean, you don't have to, you will not have a different solution if you just look at this here. Uh, the median groups in all groups and the reflection functor will take any group. That group modulo commutators. That's you know that's the universal abelian group through which any homomorphism to some abelian group will detect. Mm -hmm. So you want to just take that example and prove it. Well, but prove what? <laughs> prove <laughs> that. <laughs> um, C is actually a localization of D. It's equivalent to one. D localized at all the things that go by morphisms that play R. Or <laughs> it's also the same as the localization of D at these uh, units of the junction. <laughs> so that's the maps from, from the D's to the I R of D's. The standard right, right? <coughs> If you work these, you also get Explain more about what, what to do, also later on the break or whatever. Get stuck or didn't get, get what exactly is the exercise. Okay, so actually, what 
with these eight minutes left, maybe it's not the best time to start the next topic. <laughs> well, just... Hmm. You think... No, let's leave it at that. I'll give you the preview for, for the afternoon session. I mean, now we construct these localizations of categories. That's something that happens in, in homotopy theory, of course, and that's the thing you get here. And you can do it in many general iterations. We want to do it for schemes later on. But uh, it's not yet clear how to, how to work with this thing then in the end. I mean, the problem is that uh, the outcome, these localized categories, are usually very bad. I mean, this here, for example, first thing you can ask about is, is it cohesive? Does it have limits, co limits? This one doesn't. Mm. And it's very rare that they do, actually. There's this theorem that I learned from George Raptors, and he proved it I mean, by himself, but I'm not sure it's, he's the first. That if the homotopy category or this localization really is co complete and complete, of some co complete, complete category, then this localization was somehow trivial. It must have been of this kind here. Mm -hmm. And it cannot happen any other way. So somehow, in, in any interesting case, you will end up with a bad category. Mm -hmm. And so how to deal with this? It's not that bad. We have to introduce derived functors. That's what will happen tonight, uh, this afternoon. Mm -hmm. And to learn to, to use the construction that you had before localizing, like gluing of spaces and so on, and still make sense of them in this, in this world. Mm -hmm. And we'll go to that. Derived functors, maybe it's something you know from homological algebra, it's a special case of that. They also exist in topology and general and such things. So let me stop here and see you again. Thank you. Questions? Then we, yeah, yeah, go ahead. In, the, in the one example that we used before, there was a category of the category. Yes. And it's well-defined. Yes, absolutely. It's uh, morphems are functors. OK, you have to say small categories, if, if that's the concern. Oh, yes. <laughs> Otherwise, yes, the functor the functors will not form a set. That's 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 the problem. Problem. <laughs> if yes, any of you are interested in this, distinction between classes and sets and small sets and collections, uh, then I think we can have many good conversations later on. <laughs> Absolutely, Ingo is yeah. an expert. I, I have to learn a lot from that, actually. I just say one the universe and one I don't know <laughs> what else can be done. <laughs> yeah. Any further questions right now? <laughs> Who is looking forward to lunch? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, let's have lunch. Thank you.